Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this King's Chambers uh, webinar, uh, snappily titled Getting Ready for Mortgage Litigation. Um, I'm Nigel Clayton. I'm a barrister and member of the business and property group at King's. Um, I'm joined by two brilliant barristers, um, members of the Pro business and property group, too. I've got Nathan Smith, Dr. Nathan Smith, uh, and Ian Cooper. Uh, morning, chaps. How are you both? Yeah, good. Thank you, Nigel. How are you? Uh, good, good. Um, I'm, I'm here live from Wet and Winder Hebden Bridge in West Yorkshire. It's miserable here. Um, Ian, I see you've got the bikes in the background. Yeah, they can never be too far away. Always got to make sure <laughs> you keep an eye on them. Well, it's interesting, chaps, because uh, I remember many, many years ago sitting around um, in the old Chancery and commercial days at King's chatting about launching these mortgage webinars or seminars as they were then. I think Louis Doyle once turned to me and said, nobody's ever going to sign up for a mortgage seminar. Um, and I think we've got 352 people signed up for this. So that's really great. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, it's been a while since we've we've held our last in-person uh, seminar in Chambers. And I think we had hoped to hold this one uh, in Chambers too, but it's for various reasons, it's just not proved possible. Um, I'm sorry about that. We, I think we are aiming to get back out on the road next year with the team. Uh, so do look out for that on the King's Chambers website. Um, the reason for the title, Getting Ready for Mortgage Litigation, I, I guess is quite simple, really. Um, we've just come to the end of a, an extended period of delay uh, and disruption in relation to standard mortgage possession claims. Of course, we're now facing not just the accrual of arrears that have occurred in that period, um, but also substantial increases in mortgage interest rates uh, and a very much more restricted mortgage lending market, all of which points to us at least to possibly a rise in mortgage litigation. So I think with that in mind, we've sort of teed this up as being a, a brief um, sort of dot to dot guide to getting ready for mortgage litigation. Uh, in a moment, I'll hand over to Nathan. He's going to talk through some of the common defences to possession claims, uh, some really useful practitioner points on what to look out for. I'm going to fill in next on regulatory compliance, and this always comes with a health warning. It is deathly boring, but actually extremely important too. And then at the end, uh, an equally important session from, from Ian on practice and procedure in CPR 55 mortgage possession claims. He's called it a nuts and bolts guide. So I think something for everyone. We'll see how we go on for time. Um, if we get towards the end and we've still got a bit of time left over, I'll see if there are any questions and answers we can sort of fill in. And I'll try and direct those to the panel. Um, but otherwise, um, thanks for joining us. Let's hand straight over to Nathan on defences to possession claims. Yeah, <coughs> thanks, Nigel. Uh, as Nigel said, I'm going to talk about um, some of the common, what I would call non-standard defences to mortgage possession claims. So uh, defences that don't involve asking for time to pay or uh, reduce arrears, something more substantial uh, than that. I was having a look at some statistics um, recently uh, published in November, which indicates that compared to the last, or compared to the same quarter last year, uh, the number of mortgage possession claims is expected to increase by about uh, from about 2,800 to 3,600 this year, so an increase of about 30%. So I think you can expect to see more of these uh, non-standard uh, issues uh, arising too. So uh, what am I going to talk about in particular? Well, I picked six what I would call uh, non-standard defences to talk about, like fraud, under influence, unfair relationships, and uh, a couple of others. Uh, I'm going to go through those, highlight uh, what I think are some key points to be aware of uh, for each one, and uh, talk about some recent case law. But I'm not going to talk about uh, managing these cases uh, as effectively as possible. So um, that involve thinking about when uh, a lender may want to amend their pleadings in response to certain defences. And also the importance of uh, CPR 55.8 and uh, testing and assessing the defence the defense at the earliest possible uh, stage. And I think that's such an important point, in fact. I'm going to start with it because I think sometimes when a defence is put in, there's a might be a tendency to think, oh, well, we just need directions to trial now to 
um, to, to, to deal with this. But actually, um, you, you don't necessarily have to go to trial if uh, the defence doesn't raise something that's uh, substantial. And But um, <clears throat> for, as, as many as you might know, under CPR uh, 24.3, summary judgment isn't available uh, to uh, a mortgagee, uh, a lender in a, a residential possession claim. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, any and all defences still have to proceed to a trial, even if they don't have a real prospect of success. The control valve, though, is, is something different. It's uh, found in CPR 55.8, uh, which provides that when hearing a possession claim, a court can either decide the claim or give case management directions, uh, especially at that first uh, hearing or an adjournment to that hearing. But, uh, well, and in fact, it should only allocate uh, to track where uh, it appears that the, uh, the claim is <coughs> genuinely disputed on grounds that appeal to be substantial. Now, um, actually, uh, for some time there's a lack of authority on what that, uh, what precisely that meant, but it's been recently considered by the Court of Appeal in a case called Global 100 Limited and Lavella. And uh, in that case, the Court of Appeal noted that there's very similar wording, in fact, to the test used to set, a statute, set aside a statutory demand and held that effectively it was the same test as uh, for summary judgment. And the principles of summary judgment, of course, set out um, now in the case of Easy Air Limited. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, what, what all of that means is that if you if, if the defence doesn't have a real prospect of success, it shouldn't proceed past those uh, initial possession hearings. Now, uh, there's another consequence of this as well, in fact, that um, sometimes overlooked, which is that um, if, if you're appealing against the decision of a district judge on whether or not to give directions to trial or allocate to track, it's not an appeal against a case management decision, um, it, which of course can be quite difficult to appeal because um, it, it, it can be an exercise of discretion. What the judge is deciding there, if they decide to uh, not deal with it summarily, is uh, they're deciding that the defence, in effect, has a real prospect of success. And so if a judge, or if you disagree with the judge's assessment on that, then um, it, you're looking at what effectively is their evaluation of uh, the merits of a defence rather than an exercise of discretion. And of course, the practical point that arises from all of this is that if a lender thinks the defence doesn't have any real prospect, um, then um, it, it should um, try and deal with it uh, early on. Uh, substance, though, is just one thing uh, to consider uh, right at the start of these possession claims. And uh, another thing to consider, of course, uh, for lenders in particular, is whether or not there's a need to amend the pleadings in response to certain types of defence. And with that in mind, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, fraud or forgery, um, <clears throat> because that's a classic example of how and when you might want to amend a pleading. So, so first of all, what you need to consider when uh, raising this type of defence or responding to it. Well, first of all, um, what's the effect of a forged signature? It means that if it's established that the legal charge will be void and therefore the lender will be unable to rely upon it to obtain possession. If you're acting for a borrower, uh, one of the first things you want to think about is obtaining a handwriting uh, report uh, from, I should add, a recognised expert in the field. And I say that because if you have a good quality report, uh, a lender is more likely to take note of it <clears throat> if you have a report from someone who's not uh, well recognised or not qualified, they're less likely to do so. And uh, you also need to consider, uh, if acting for borrowers, whether or not you need to counterclaim, uh, because if your case is that the uh, legal charge is void, you probably want to counterclaim to remove it from uh, the register of title. But I just say a word of caution about relying upon too many, well, relying upon too much on expert handwriting reports because it's an important piece of evidence, but it's rarely conclusive. I mean, often uh, in mortgage cases, the original signature uh, may not be available. So that can um, reduce the conclusions that an expert is able to make. And of course, the reports only pass the picture anyway. You might want to ask um, what the witnesses to the legal charge, if they can be found, remember. Uh, find out about the circumstances in which the legal charge was filed or, or was signed, 
And uh, there's also likely to be relevant evidence on the lending file um, and other documents that uh, may have been signed at the time the mortgage was taken out. Or, uh, and indeed, there's likely to be relevant information after that date when um, payment's been chased. It might be that um, the borrowers acknowledged the mortgage during that uh, period. So as I say, handwriting, of course, very useful, um, but um, it, it should be viewed, I think, as a starting point and other sources of information often um, very relevant too. What about from the lender's point of view? Well, um, if you're dealing with allegations of forgery, um, part of the initial step is, of course, to assess the merits of what's um, what's being said uh, in, in a general way. But uh, another important step is to consider whether the lender has any alternative claims they might want to bring. And there are two alternative claims that often arise when uh, forgery allegations are made. Uh, one is, of course, subrogation. And the second uh a potential claim is, is for an equitable charge. Subrogation, of course, essentially a remedy in unjust enrichment where a lender redeems an earlier charge with loan advance uh, but fails to obtain the legal charge that they bargained for, uh, perhaps because it's due to forgery, a lender can step into the shoes of the prior lender. And then, of course, you have to go through this um, exercise of reconstructing uh, what is uh, called a subrogation account. Um, and, and of course, it, 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 there might be a dispute about the prior charge, but um, if there's a previous prior, prior charge, then uh, provided you can trace the mortgage advance back into that prior charge, um, you can go back and subrogate to that too. And there's no real limit as to how far back you can go. Equitable charge, that's something uh, slightly different. And um, you have a joint mortgage over a property and one signature is forged, but the other one's not. The effect of the valid signature is to create an equitable charge over the beneficial interest of the person who has signed. Again, uh, that can be useful, especially in uh, cases where there's a joint mortgage and um, only one, uh, one, for, one, one signature has been shown to be uh, forged. Uh, but of course, you do need to amend the pleadings in both those cases. You need to amend the claim form and the thickness of claim, not just mention it in the reply because the relief that you seek um, is slightly different, particularly where I an mean, equitable charge needs to seek uh, an order for sale uh, as well. So, uh, and, and perhaps this adds to that, it's obviously important to be aware of these types of claims from the point of view of a borrower too, because it may well mean for the borrower that even if the defence of forgery is successful, the lender can still obtain possession by relying on these alternative claims. So uh, you need to consider them as part of the overall strategy. Is a second uh, non-standard defence undue influence. Now, uh, this typically arises, as everyone probably knows, where a spouse is asked to put his or her share of the family home up as security for their partner's business borrowings. And the case law draws a distinction between actual undue influence and presumed undue influence, uh, which, of course, and both of those, of course, generally take place uh, between uh, the spouses so that the lender has no real idea what um, has gone on. And so the, the, the question uh, for lenders is whether or not they've been put on notice of any uh, allegation of uh, undue uh, influence. As for notice, um, that can be actual, uh, imputed or constructive. But uh, the first question, of course, is um, whether the situation is such as to put the lender on notice. Um, a good example of this is um, the Ettridge case itself. That was a case where there was a jointly owned property where the uh, wife was asked to provide security for the husband's uh, business debts. That's a case where a lender is put on notice. But contrast that with uh, CIBC mortgages and uh, Pitt, a case involving uh, our own Nigel Clayton. Uh, in that case, uh, there was a joint loan where the wife entered into the loan as a joint borrower. And uh, the effect of that was that... Um, uh, that the lender wasn't uh, put on notice. And, and you can have more complicated situations where, for example, the wife might stand as surety uh, for company borrowings in which she has an interest. And there's some case law on that too. But this is, I think, just one of the first questions to, um, to ask. And secondly, if uh, a lender is put on uh, notice, they need to consider whether uh, there's been compliance with the guidance in uh, Ettridge. Generally speaking, if a lender has a certificate from a slip the thing that uh, the uh, the spouse that's giving security has been properly advised. 
then uh, that's sufficient. But you can go a stage beyond that because um, in order for that certificate to be properly uh, valid, you need to consider uh, whether there's been proper communication between uh, the lender and, um, and and the person giving the guarantee. There should be correspondence direct with them. Uh, secondly, you have to consider whether they've actually been given enough information or the solicitor has been given enough information about the other spousal affairs to properly provide some advice. And thirdly, whether, in fact, independent legal advice has been provided. Uh, but, but as I say, what's not um, usually relevant is the uh, adequacy of the uh, solicitor's advice uh, once um, proper information and communication has uh, been given. So if uh, the complaint by the borrower is that the solicitor didn't advise them properly, having received the full information from the lender, then um, that's unlikely to be uh, sufficient. And indeed, uh, in those types of cases, it's something you might want to look at dealing with uh, summarily. And of course, alternative claims, will they crop up in undue influence too? Um, undue influence doesn't make a charge void, it makes it voidable. But um, if, if the charge is um, set aside, then um, subrogation, things like equitable charges, uh, come to the fore again. But those need to be dealt with by amendment uh, at an early uh, stage in the proceeding. So unfair relationships, well, these are, I think, increasingly common in, in certain types of, uh, in, in, well, increasingly common um, type of claim, I think, that the court's becoming more familiar with and could be a talk in its own right. But the key point, uh, following from Plevin and Paragon Personal Finance, uh, which isn't a mortgage case, of course, it dealt with uh, non-disclosed commission received by a broker, but the key point from it is that um, since uh, that decision, it's been possible to establish the relationships unfair, even if there hasn't been a breach of regulatory duty. And Nigel's going to talk a bit more about uh, regulatory duties. But of course, the court has a very broad remit when looking at unfair relationships. Under Section 140A, it can take into account any of the terms of the agreement, the way in which the creditor is enforced, um, any rights and any other thing done or not done um, by or on behalf of the creditors. So very wide uh, provisions and where the relationship is found to be unfair, so it also has very wide powers to uh, grant relief. But if you come across uh, a defence relying upon an unfair relationship or even are considering raising the defence in mortgage possession proceedings, uh, the first question to ask is whether they these provisions apply at all because there is well, there are two important exemptions in Section 140A itself. One is in relation to the bounce back uh, loan scheme, but the more relevant one is uh, in subsection five, which um, effectively excludes or makes exempt from the unfair relationship provisions anything that's uh, already regulated under Article 60C2 of the Regulated Activities Orders Order. And that excludes a lot of regulated mortgage contracts and regulated home purchase plans uh, from uh, the scope of this provision. So um, if, if you find a defence, if you come across a defence like this, but in fact, you've got a regulated mortgage uh, contract, then um, subject to checking the, the exemption precisely, then um, again, that's something might be, could be dealt with summarily. Even when uh, the provisions do apply, that, that doesn't stop a summary uh, disposal occurring. There's a recent example of that. Uh, there was a decision uh, from Mr. Justice uh, Snowden uh, on appeal, ultimately, which he, which he upheld, where he upheld the decision of the uh, first instance judge to uh, dismiss an unfair relationship defence summarily. And that's in the Pro Montoria uh, case against Hancock. Now, in that case, um, Mr. Hancock borrowed about £1.5 million pounds from a lender and granted uh, three, legal three legal charges over uh, over some properties, over three properties. Um, uh, ultimately, the lender became promontoria. And uh, while the case dealt in part with setting aside a statutory demand, um, promontoria also issued separate possession proceedings and applied for summary determination of those proceedings under uh, CPR 55.8 uh, 1A. And at that determination, um, Mr. Hancock's defence that there was an unfair relationship uh, was rejected. And 
there's a really interesting or useful paragraph, I think, in the judgment of Mr. Justice Snowden, um, paragraph 40, where he says that it's important to note um, that section 140b9, so that's the section of the um, Consumer Credit Act that puts the burden of proving that the relationship uh, is fair on the creditor. It's, it's important to note that even where that's applicable, um, it, it cannot be the case that uh, it means no summary disposal can take place. A debtor cannot simply make a fair allegation of unfairness and insist on the case going to trial. There must be some credible evidence to support such an allegation so as to give the rise to some realistic prospect the creditor will fail to satisfy the burden under section 140b9 at trial. So if you think that what's said in the defence can't possibly give rise to unfairness, it's worth uh, still worth considering summary disposal of that type of allegation um, as part of the procedure under 55.81a. Uh, and I also mentioned uh, the Greenland's trading limited case in this. This, this isn't, that wasn't a case where the unfair relationship defence was dealt with summarily, but it was a decision where uh, there was a claim that uh, a default interest rate of 3% per month um, was unfair and it was found not to be. Which brings me neatly on to penalties because uh, sometimes an allegation is made that um, an interest rate or a charge uh, to an account is penal in nature. And so the first question to ask for this type of uh, this type of case is whether in substance the clause does actually operate when a breach of contract occurs. If not, it's not a penalty uh, clause. In, in other words, you have to distinguish between a penalty clause um, and a, a conditional primary obligation, which depends upon uh, events that are not uh, breaches. But if uh, it, it is that type of clause, let's say if it is a penalty clause, then it's a very useful summary of the law um, the law is now set out by the Supreme Court case in MacDessie, but it's a very useful summary of that in a uh, High Court decision of Vivian Westwood Limited. And the key issue um, essentially is whether um, if a secondary liability is imposed for breach of primary obligation, that's if you have a penalty clause, whether, or potential penalty clause, whether it imposes on the party in default a detriment that's out of all proportion to any legitimate interest of the innocent party or which is exorbitant, extravagant, or unconscionable in comparison with the value of the legitimate interest. And, and, and some other key points to take away are that, that the onus is on the party alleging the clause is a penalty to show that the secondary liability is uh, exorbitant. And uh, secondly, at least uh, in cases where you have uh, parties with equal bargaining power who are properly advised, um, because the penalty rule is an interference with freedom of contract, and um, courts generally uh, don't uh, likely conclude that, um, that uh, clauses are penalty clauses. And so one area where this does crop up in, uh, in respect of mortgages uh, sometimes is uh, interest rates. And a uh, recent case that considered those type of issues is the Ahudra Investments Limited uh, case, uh, decision of his honour Judge Hodge, where he found that a rate of 12% per month, um, which was charged and compounded monthly was a penalty. But uh, it was, it's worth noting, of course, it was held to be a penalty in part because there was no evidence, or no good evidence from the lender dealing with the market rates at the time of the loan agreement or the risk uh, factors involved. Let's say the additional risk um, premium associated with a, um, with a default in the particular case, um, or indeed the rationale for setting it up about four times the initial rate. The judge did say that, uh, interestingly, and this probably is no more than a rule of thumb, shouldn't be relied on too, too strongly, but he did say that uh, for an increase of up to 200% in the applicable uh, rate, I uh, probably wouldn't have thought that the evidential burden switched to uh, the lender and would have uh, been prepared to accept that that was uh, justified by the greater credit risk of a defaulting borrower. Uh, con contrast that case with the Cargill case, um, I mentioned in the slide, where a contract term providing for a default rate of interest of uh, one month LIBOR plus 12% was held to be valid and enforceable. Um, but in that case, there was um, comparable rate evidence and uh, evidence uh, dealing with the increased uh, credit risk of, of, of credit default. There's also a useful summary, in fact, in the Carpio case of some different cases where different rates have been uh, upheld uh, or not. 
But I, I give a brief warning uh, in respect to those that each case depends on its own facts. And you have to bear in mind, of course, the dates when these cases were, um, were decided when the interest rates might have been quite different. But if you are faced with an issue about whether or not a charge or rate is penal, to give you a practical point, which is that I think uh, it's very important that uh, issues such as market rates, risk factors, and the rationale for the increase um, is addressed uh, in evidence. Non est factum. Now, this is a defence that often, <laughs> for some reason, crops up because it's actually very difficult to establish. Um, literally, it means not my deed. And it's where someone signs a document, believing it to be something of a very different character to what, in fact, it is. Um, the leading case is uh, Saunders and Andia Building Society. Um, but as you'd expect, the party of full age and understanding is, not nor it is normally bound by signature for a document, whether or not they read or understand it. And so the key elements for a successful plea set out in the Ludina case are, are, are these. Firstly, that the, uh, the character of the document being signed is something quite different or radically different. Secondly, there uh, needs to be some sort of disability or impairment that, give, that, uh, that explains the reason for the signature. And, and uh, thirdly, it can't, this plea and this defence can't be invoked by someone who doesn't take the trouble to find out at least the general uh, effect of the document or who doesn't act carefully. Uh, it's generally said there's a heaven, heavy burden of proof on a person who seeks to invoke uh, the remedy. Uh, an, an example of where it succeeded is, is a case called Kerr and Jameson. That's a case, I think, from Northern Ireland, in fact, where an elderly person who couldn't read the document uh, she signed was held to be able to rely upon the doctrine um, because she believed uh, that uh, the particular document she signed was entitled to entitled as a £40,000 for a parcel of land, when in fact it was a gratuitous transfer. But um, in reality, it's quite rare for this that type of defence uh, to succeed and usually it needs some sort of exceptional circumstances. Uh, Frame and Foy is a, is a recent case where the defence was uh, rejected on the facts. And then finally, just before I finish, I, so I flag up the uh, moratoria that are now available under the debt respite scheme uh, regulations. Um, the, the, you have to be careful with uh, looking at these regulations because um, in the context of uh, mortgages and secured debt, uh, the definitions uh, can be quite difficult to follow uh, through. But essentially, um, the, uh, the regulations apply, as I understand it at least, to arrears of secured debt that are in existence at the date that the moratorium uh, is granted. Uh, but of course, it's usually arrears that are built up over a long period of time that are relied upon to obtain uh, possession. And, and, and if uh, those arrears are caught by the moratorium, then a lender can't take steps to enforce. There is quite a lot of some good guidance on this, in fact, in, in, the, uh, in, in the government publication. Um, it's available on www.gov.uk in the Debt Respite Scheme Breathing Space Guidance for uh, Creditors. Um, it, what I wanted to just highlight was a, was a case I came across in the county court, an unreported case of West One Loan Limited and uh, Salad. And what was happening in that case effectively was that there were several joint uh, debtors who owed money and uh, one applied for a moratorium first and, and, and that stopped the enforcement of a possession order. And then as the, when, when that would expire, the second one applied and, and I think there were about four co-debtors and, and the creditor was a bit fed up with that uh, situation. So applied to court and the judge granted an injunction, in fact, to stop um, the process being uh, abused. And, uh, and so I think that's quite, just quite an interesting uh, case to flag up because there's not a huge amount of case law on moratoria at the moment. So I've set out two other cases below the Lee's decision and the Axe and break decision. But I think this is an interesting area to... Uh, be aware of and to uh, watch develop. So, uh, just to wrap all that up, uh, a bit of a quick tour through some non standard uh, defences, but I just emphasise these key points. I think, first of all, evaluate the defence, the first opportunity, don't let it just drift uh, to trial. Uh, secondly, 
uh, if it's not disputed on substantial grounds, think about summary uh, disposal. And uh, thirdly, consider what amendments need to be made in light of certain defences, whether or not, um, based on the borrower's point of view and the lender's point of view, um, additional claims are likely to be brought um, and, and the effect of those claims on whether or not a defence is likely to ultimately be uh, successful in resisting an order for possession. So uh, with that, I'll hand back to Nigel uh, for his uh, part of the talk. Thanks, Nathan. That's a really, really helpful run through. Um, just reflecting on some of the things you've said, I think one of the things that jumps out to me at the end is, um, and it's practical advice, I guess, if you're acting for a borrower, um, always, always, always weigh at cost benefit. Um, you know, my experience, um, unless you have a knockout defence and you're secure on costs, mortgage litigation rarely turns out to be a happy experience. Um, and although it's often unpalatable advice to give to a borrower client, there is a lot to be said in the long run for cutting and running, um, possibly agreeing a voluntary sale early and taking out as much equity as possible rather than risk it all in litigation. Um, but thanks, Nathan. Um, that's really helpful. All right, um, let's move on. So regulatory compliance. Um, I guess if, if you're minded to go for a cup of tea, now may be a good time to do it. Um, Last week, I was joined by uh, Nathan and Ian and some other colleagues in the property team, and we gave um, a, 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 a half-day flagship property conference, and it was entitled Land Registration Demystified. Um, I, not surprisingly, was talking about mortgages, and the first slide I put up was this. Um, and I did that, I guess, to try and lower everyone's expectations that I actually knew what I was talking about when it came to mortgages. But... I think when it comes to regulatory compliance, um, I'd add this. Um, you will know from your own experience, whether you're a, a, a junior practitioner or a more senior practitioner, that um, statutory and regulatory compliance is hugely complicated. It always has been. Um, the only thing I can throw into the mix, I guess, is that I suspect it's becoming slightly more easier um, as we move away from regulation to the Consumer Credit Act. Um, but it's nonetheless, it's a tricky area. I couldn't persuade Nathan or Ian to cover this, so I've got the slot. Um, what I'm going to do is just a quick run through, a step-by-step -step guide of the main headline points. And it, it comes with an apology. It is a quick run through. Um, try and bear with this. These are some of the sources that I look at when I deal with regulatory and statutory issues. Um, we start, of course, with the FCA handbook. Um, I've listed various sections in the handbook. And in fact, um, you'll know that the FCA loves its acronyms. Um, there is a glossary on my penultimate slide, which will appear in the notes that come out. So NCOB, of course, we're probably all familiar with that, Mortgages and Home Finance Conduct to Business Source Book, uh, or I just call it the Mortgage Conduct to Business Rules. CONC is the Consumer Credit Source Book, uh, DISP, Dispute Resolution and Complaints, and PERG, the Perimeter Guidance Manual. That's an awful lot of detail uh, in each of those handbooks. Um, I often have regard to the FOS website, and I'll just, when I get to the slides, I'll talk through what it covers. Um, a bit of a plug to the book I wrote a couple of years ago, Atkins Court Forms, Volume 28, One on Mortgages. It's actually pretty well bang up to date on a lot of practice and procedure with a lot of court forms that have been totally rewritten. And equally, you'll find a lot of that detail um, on my website, www.legalmortgage.co.uk. And in particular, um, if you want to go onto the site, you'll see under um, updates, you can sign up for free monthly updates on all things mortgages. Uh, there is another textbook I sometimes refer to as well, uh, Retail Mortgages Law Regulation and Procedure. Um, but as I say, I'll post these notes with the glossary um, on my website after this, and they'll be available in Chambers too. So quick overview on what we're going to cover, the four main headline topics. Um, what do we mean by regulation? What does it involve? And two particular areas, the need for authorization and redress and complaints. 
Um, what do we mean by regulation, first of all? Well, I mentioned briefly there has been a progressive shift in statutory and regulatory compliance. Uh, fortunately, away from the CCA 74 uh, with management by the OFT uh, towards um, management by the FCA under the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000. Uh, and with it, of course, substantial secondary legislation and rules. So in real terms, and so far as it affects mortgages, um, there's now little scope for statutory and regulatory compliance under the Consumer Credit Act. Um, I suspect we all breathe a, a collective sigh of relief. Um, let's just start at the beginning. And what do we mean by regulation? Well, the position today is that most high street residential owner-occupied mortgages are likely to be uh, regulated mortgage contracts. That's a term of art that's used uh, to define a particular type of mortgage contract. It appears in Article 61 of the Regulated Activities Order, and it brings those contracts within the statutory and regulatory regime of both the Act and the rules. Uh, what are regulated mortgage contracts or RMCs? Well, the definition has changed over time. It's important to, 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 to recognise this, that now, with effect from 21st of March 2016, um, a regulated mortgage contract is a contract under which a lender provides credit to a borrower, uh, which provides for the obligation to repay to be secured on land in the EEA, and at least 40% of that land is used or intended to be used as or in connection with a dwelling. So, it's a wide definition. You'll spot, first of all, that it, it no longer is limited to first charges, which is how the original definition was framed. It applies to any security now. Uh, and note as well the reference to 40%. There is quite a few bits of case law uh, and quite a bit of reference in, in MCOP uh, about um, how that 40% threshold is to be applied in any particular case. There are some exemptions to regulation as uh, regulated mortgage contracts there in Article 60C, et cetera, of the Regulated Activities Order. A, a common example that I frequently come across in practice, particularly with niche lenders, uh, is where there's lending of £25,000 or more for business purposes. And there's a specific exemption for that. and There are some specific provisions about how that exemption works. For example, there's a particular form of certificate uh, that can be used for the exemption. It sets up a presumption. Um, but for those mortgages that fall outside the definition of regulated mortgage contracts, or if they fall within one of the exemptions, there is still limited residual regulation as a regulated credit agreement under both FSMA and CONC, that's a consumer credit source bank. An important point. To flag up here, and Nathan's mentioned this very briefly in his section, it applies to the unfair relationship test in section 140A, et cetera, Consumer Credit Act. Uh, we know from practice that although the unfair relationship provisions extend to all credit agreements, um, after 21st of March 2016, no order can be made under section 140B in respect of a regulated mortgage contract because it's an exempt credit agreement. And that appears in section 140A5 of the CCA. So that actually takes out of the reach of the unfair relationship provisions, most high street residential owner occupied mortgages. And again, that reflects the policy shift away from regulation by the CCA uh, towards separate regulation under the FSMA and MCOB. The FSMA is, as I mentioned briefly, subject to really extensive secondary legislation. Uh, the most important one is a regulated activities order. Um, but the FSMA in principle established the FCA, former the FSA, as the principal regulator, and it conferred on the FCA um, a general rulemaking power, which it achieves through the FCA handbook. Now, I'm just pausing there. It's a bit of a <laughs> misnomer. If you've ever had to look online at the FCA handbook, uh, it's not a handbook at all. I think the thing I always say when I'm speaking about this is that if it's printed out end to end, it would fill a, a small warehouse. Um, it's huge, it's extensive, and it's split now into two parts effectively. It contains rules 
you'll see those in a, a square box with R and guidance, a square box with G. It used to have evidential provisions, E as well, but it doesn't anymore. Um, the handbook, as I mentioned briefly earlier, it contains various standards, guides, and other sources, but it effectively covers a whole range of financial services, um, including mortgage lending, etc. So the principal rules in the Mortgage Conduct of Business Rules, uh, it regulates a range of activities involving regulated mortgage contracts applying to what it calls four types of firm. Again, don't be misled by the expression firm. It can include individuals, uh, businesses or whatever. Um, but it covers the whole range of, of, of parties who are engaged in mortgage um, lending, lenders and providers, administrators, arrangers and advisors. And I've summarized some of the key points in MCOB. It actually goes on more extensive than this. And you'll see on the list there the range of things it covers. Um, particular mention to mortgage litigators is to be aware at the bottom of MCOB 13, which contains particular provisions about arrears, repayment shortfalls, and in particular, repossessions. So let's move on to something else. And this is about authorization now, which is another key topic uh, in regulatory compliance. Uh, the FCA requires authorization to carry on regulated activities, and that's frequently referred to as a Part 4 or Part 4A permission. And this is, and I'm going to set out now briefly how it regulates the activities. Section 19 contains a really important provision. It's the general prohibition. No person may carry on a regulated activity in the UK unless he is an authorised person. A regulated activity here includes an activity of a specified kind, which is carried on by way of business. Now, that's an important qualification. So a one-off private mortgage that you may take to secure a loan wouldn't be by way of business, and it doesn't require authorization. But if you are entering into mortgage lending as a business with a commercial element or a certain amount of frequency then you are likely to be carrying it on by way of business and you're required to be uh, authorised to do that. There is particular guidance about that in the Perimeter Guidance Manual um, in the FCA handbook. And just for completeness there, we see that entering into a regulated mortgage contract is a specified kind of activity for these purposes. So just following through the way that the general prohibition applies, um, an agreement made in contravention of the general prohibition is both a criminal offence, um, but it also, and this is more of more relevance to civil litigators, um, it means that the agreement is unenforceable against the other party. It also gives the other party to the right the right to recover money paid plus compensation um, calculated in accordance with section 28.2. But that, again, is subject to an important qualification that lenders frequently have to rely upon. If the court's satisfied it's just inequitable in the circumstance of the case, it may allow the agreement to be enforced and any money paid to be retained. And that's called an enforcement order. I've mentioned there an example of how this can sometimes throw up some tricky points, the case of Fort Well Finance. Um, in considering whether to allow the agreement to, in, to be enforced, whether to make an enforcement order, the court is specifically directed to have regard to certain matters in sections 28, 4 to 6. And in a nutshell, it's whether the person carrying on the regulated activity concerned reasonably believed he was not contravening the general prohibition. I mentioned a couple of cases, Halden and Strathmore and Jackson and Ailes. Uh, Heldon Strathmore is an interesting one. It's a, it's a Newberger, Lord Newberger decision, and it actually demonstrates quite a bit of judicial flexibility um, in applying those provisions. Um, an important point, um, I guess, now for borrowers to always bear in mind that if the court doesn't grant an enforcement order um, and the borrower elects not to perform the unenforceable agreement, you must still repay any money received by him under the agreement. So there's no windfall here, uh, and the lender will at least be able to recover the principal. 
And again, a specific authority on that, it's right at the end of this decision, it's Dickinson and UK Acorn Finance Court of Appeal. So I turn now to one of the other headline topics. This is redress and complaint. Uh, And I emphasize here the vast majority of mortgage, and I put this in inverted commas, issues or problems, they're resolved by way of complaint to the lender and or the financial ombudsman service. Um, In fact, and certainly increasingly in my experience, these issues aren't resolved in standard day-to-day mortgage litigation. I think litigation as um, Ian's going to tell us is very much a last resort. And I think the particular point to bear in mind that the scope of redress is usually substantially wider than relying upon a cause of action at law. So just running through this, in terms of complaint to the lender, first of all, um, authorised firms are required to operate um, an effective and transparent procedure, the reasonable and prompt handling of complaints in accordance with specific complaint handling rules in the FCA handbook. And there's a mention to DISP, uh, which is the Dispute Resolution and Complaints section of the FCA, the FCA handbook. Um, in particular, the rules require the lender to treat complainants promptly and fairly. I just thought I'd throw in here, there are some specific rules for handling mortgage endowment complaints, DISP App 1. Um, and I think from seeing the uh, FCA's website and some of the notes and commentary about this, that I know has been a very busy area um, for handling complaints. But apart from complaining direct to the lender, there is, of course, the um, further alternative route of complaining to the financial ombudsman service. And again, there are some particular provisions about the jurisdiction of the FOS in DISP 2.1. It's a statutory scheme, so there are certain sections in the FSMA that apply to this. And it handles uh, complaints concerning a whole range of mortgage issues. And I've listed there on the screen the type of issues that it frequently has to deal with. I think one of the key points to note, I've mentioned this briefly before, is that the the FOS has really wide powers to resolve a complaint. Uh, It'll determine a complaint by reference to what is, in its opinion, this is the important bit, what's fair and reasonable in all the circumstances of the case, taking into account relevant law and regulation and good industry practice at the time. It's a really wide sort of remit um, to entertain complaint. I mentioned the FOS usually gives um, a written determination. Uh, It may include an award, which can include money, interest or costs, or it may include some other direction. Um, The sort of jurisdiction to entertain um, complaints varies from time to time, Um, Checking the site, the current maximum award uh, is £375,000. And interestingly, that award can then be enforced through the courts. And I note finally that the FOS says uh, it takes around four months. It uses the word allocate cases. I think that means to to deal with cases or nine to 12 months if the complaint is uh, particularly complex. Um, I suspect many people watching this will have had some experience of dealing with the FOS. um, And it's fair to say that you do get a whole range of decisions, um, some of which appear very competent, very well worked through, uh, some less so. Just mention um, some other points that are important to bear in mind. Um, If the award is accepted by a complainant, it is final and binding. It gives rise to what we call in law still a raised judicata. And there's the authority on the point. Um, but just moving on, um, apart from utilising the complaints procedure uh, or any separate common law cause of action, um, a contravention um, by an authorised person of a rule made by the FCA is actionable in damages at the suit of a private person. And that's preserved by Section 138D2 of the FSMA. And again, rather confusingly, there are separate rules about what a private person is. And I've mentioned the particular regulations there. Interestingly, there is a a list of rules in MCOB, which are actionable in damages. That's MCOB Schedule 5. 
And I've given an example of a case that involved a claim for all three types of um, damages as well, Mason and Good Eye for Mortgages. Important points to bear in mind here, um, I guess, contravention of a rule doesn't make any transaction void or unenforceable. And significantly, it's not a defence to a claim for possession. That's the Thacker Northern Rock case. And nor finally, for completeness, does the existence of the statutory duty um, give rise to a coextensive duty of care um, at common law. I mentioned right at the beginning the glossary. There it is. Um, I'll include this in the written notes as they go out. But um, again, apologies. Um, I, I do readily recognise the complexity um, of both the FSMA and the FCA handbook. So that's it from me. Um, I hope you've been able to follow that. Again, I apologise the complexity. It's um, it's one of those difficult areas to, to sort of understand and apply, but it is so important. And I'm back now with Ian Cooper and I'll hand over to Ian. Thanks, Ian. Thanks very much, Nigel. So uh, this is a quote you will have recognised from Nigel's talk just before. Before I explain what I'm going to be talking about, I thought it, it is a bit of a disservice uh, to Nigel uh, to not complete this quote. Lord McNaughton had, was in the unenviable position of having to write a judgment on mortgages without having the benefits of the legal mortgage website, which... Nigel has referenced, and also his chapter on Lexis concerning mortgages. Had he had that, I'm sure that the quote may have ended differently. As it is, he didn't. So what I'm going to be talking about today, and I did skip over the title slide, but you'll have seen that it was called Possession Claims Practice and Procedure, a Nuts and Bolts Guide. We only have 25 minutes or so. I'm conscious you've all got busy days to be getting to. Uh, what I want to talk about for the next few in the next few minutes are the particular peculiarities and quirks of bringing mortgage possession claims specifically. Nathan has given some statistics which indicate that there is going to be an, a big uptick or it's likely that there will be an uptick in mortgage possessions, that is no doubt going to be exacerbated by the harsh economic climate that we find ourselves in and the winter to come. So I'm going to talk about mortgage possession proceedings specifically. I won't talk about the more general aspects of CPR Part 55. And I've put on the slide here that it's important to remember that, and as Nigel's alluded to, possession proceedings are one part of a larger armoury uh, that a mortgagee will have. There are other remedies available, uh, receivership, appointment of a receiver, or exercising a power of sale. And I I'm not going to talk about those today. They're topics for another day. Nevertheless, if one finds that they have exhausted other avenues and are dealing with possession claims, this is where we turn to. So I've set out on this slide the relevant bits of law that one should have to hand. And I make no excuse for the fact that these slides, which I believe will be distributed following the hearing, do contain lots of detail. I'm not going to be able to talk through all of that detail. The intention is that these slides provide you with a reference point so that you are able to, if the answer isn't provided in the next few minutes, hopefully the text in the slides will help you to go off and find the answer. So what we're looking at is primarily part 55 of the CPR, practice direction 55A, and then, of course, the pre-action protocol for possession claims uh, based on mortgage or home purchase plan arrears. And that's very important uh, words focus on there in respect of residential property. I've put as well a list of the forms, and these are mortgage specific forms when we're concerned with the N120 and the N123 checklist, as well as the defence. Uh, so if you're doing litigation concerning mortgage possession, it's important to remember that there are specific forms to be used. But there is a practical point to remember as well, which is that these standardised forms can be quite restrictive. You may find that the format isn't doesn't allow for you to provide all of the detail that you need to provide. And... A point I'd highlight is that practitioners shouldn't feel constrained by these forms. 
it's recognised under part four of the CPR that amendments can be made to and variations can be made to forms where the circumstances require it. And that is something to be alive to. There is nothing wrong with including an appendix to your N120 particulars of claim within which you go on to provide all of that detail that's mandated the relevant provision for particulars of claim under the practice direction 55A, a paragraphs 2.1 and 2.5. And when you look at those paragraphs, you'll see that there's a lot of detail that needs to be provided. And you may find that it's easier to provide that detail in an appendix as opposed to the body of the particulars itself. Now, there are four things that I hope to address with you today, should time allow. Uh, firstly, with the impact of COVID. Secondly, case preparation, looking at some of the key aspects we're getting right in case preparation. Thirdly, a reminder as to what happens at a first hearing. And then fourthly, I'll, I'll touch briefly upon the statutory discretion that the that judges have under the Administration of Justice Act 1917-73. So turning first to COVID-19. Now, in my uh, the, the pricey, the summary of what I would be talking about today, w one of the questions to be answered was what impact, if any, does COVID still have on mortgage possess possession proceedings? We have on the slide here the relevant provisions of practice direction 55C. You'll see that paragraph 1.1 makes clear that the practice direction has now come to an end. The interim period has ended. Uh, th there was some ongoing compliance required, uh, you'll see under paragraph 1.9 that the uh, a notice had to be provided uh, setting out the impact of a claimant's, the, the knowledge as to what impact a claimant has, uh, apologies, the claimant's knowledge as to the impact that COVID has had on a defendant and their defendants. Uh, that requirement has ended in the, as of the 30th of June uh, this year. The wording of paragraph 1.8 of the practice direction does suggest that the practice direction will continue to have effect uh, in relation to claims issued before the 1st of December last year. So if, for case management reasons, uh, perhaps have been adjournments, perhaps things have gone missing in the interim, you find yourself with a case uh, which was issued prior to December of last year. Do be alive to uh, that provision. We turn then to the, to the second point to be addressed, namely case preparation. Now, this is case preparation before issue. Uh, the, the first point of call is the pre-action protocol for possession claims based on mortgage or home purchase plan arrears. Uh, I've put it in capitals and in bold, we're concerned here with arrears. So it, it, it's not an instance of a repayable on demand. Uh, if the whole sum is falls due, that's not uh, what this protocol is designed, is primarily aimed at, nor is it aimed at buy-to-let mortgages. Uh, the scope of the protocol is set out in paragraph 4.1. It applies to first charge residential mortgage and purchase plans, second charge mortgages over regulated property and other loans which are regulated by the Consumer Credit Act 74, and then also unregulated residential mortgages. Stepping back in substance, what it applies to is residential mortgages. Uh, I've said it applies to arrears. Of course, it also doesn't apply if the reason for the mortgage possession claim is perhaps a, a breach of another provision of the mortgage. So it, it, it's not a financial breach in the sense of arrears. It might be abandonment of the property. It might be bankruptcy. Uh, it might be non-payment of service charge or ground rent. In those circumstances, the protocol doesn't apply. What I would say uh, is that, and I've put on the slide the fact that should you proceed to issue and go to your first hearing, you need to take two copies of the N123 checklist along with you. Even if the checklist doesn't apply, the wording is a bit ambiguous, really. I, the first question on the checklist is, is this claim within the scope of the protocol? Uh, you might say that it's not. I'd still take two copies of that checklist along with you, confirming that it's not. Uh, just so as to make sure that you've got all your ducks in a row when demonstrating to the judge why it is that they can proceed to make a possession order if that's what's being sought at the first hearing. I've put as well on the slide that the 
protocol doesn't change a party's legal rights and obligations. So it doesn't dis non-compliance with the protocol doesn't disentitle the mortgagee to obtain possession. It's relevant for the purposes of sanctions. Now, the sanctions are set out in paragraph 16 of a different part of the CPR. That's the practice direction on pre-action conduct and protocols. Those sanctions, as no doubt we all know, are concerned primarily interest and costs. Ultimately, what this protocol is aiming to do is encourage lenders to see possession proceedings as being really a matter of last resort. Paragraph five of the protocol, and I would recommend that before issuing, you do, of course, read uh, the substance of what's required envisaged under paragraphs five and six. Uh, paragraph five sets out all of the conduct that's to be expected before issuing a claim. So here we're concerned with the provision of information by the lender, D uh, discussions around possible co the causes of the arrears, considerations of payment proposals. Uh, and paragraph six goes on to consider when it is, or to set out those instances in which a lender might be considered, might be expected to consider postponing their claim. Now, uh, I've put at the bottom uh, a point, in two points in purple. Firstly, it doesn't define conduct post-issue. I say that because some of the obligations set out in the pre-action protocol are, for example, that if a proposal for sale uh, or postponement is put forward by the borrower who's looking to avoid a mortgage possession, there's an, uh, an expectation that the lender responds to that. And if they reject that proposal, that reason, good re reasons are given and the court can then assess those reasons. Once the claim, the possession claim has been issued, uh, the those obligations no longer apply. Of course, the court would, that's not carte blanche to then act unreasonably. It's just to make sure that you're alive to the point if a borrower is raising arguments in the proceedings with reference to the pre-action protocol. The pre-action protocol is no longer uh, guiding, uh, determining the nature of the party's conduct that's required. The other point in purple is uh, there's a slight anomaly in the checklist. Some of the questions which are asked in the protocol, in the checklist, apologies, which you take along to the first hearing, uh, concern the conduct that the borrower has engaged in in the three months prior to the date that the checklist is being completed. And these are the nature of the discussions that's been had with the lender. Now, it may well be the case that you're completing your checklist after you've issued your claim. So your three months prior, the three month time period being considered, the three months prior to the completion of the checklist may well include some of the conduct that has occurred post issue. Not much comes of that beyond highlighting it as a point of consideration. The previous slide was de dealing with case preparation before issue. If you've complied with the protocol and it's been decided to proceed to issue, there's then some key case preparation to be thought about before the first hearing. And I've got on the slide here, the rule 55.10 notices. These are one of the, the key unique features of mortgage possession proceedings as opposed to other possession proceedings. And the 55.10 notices require as set out on the slide that the claimant must send notice to three parties, uh, to the tenant or occupier. So it must be addressed to the tenant or occupier at the property, to the housing department of the local authority within which the property is located. And thirdly, to any registered proprietor holding a registered charge. You'll note that the wording under 55.10 is receiving notice of hearing. It doesn't use the language of service. Uh, so that again is a point to be alive to. The content of the letters is mandated under Rule 55.10, sub rules three and three A. The letters have sent to the property have got to explain that a possession claim for the property has been started. It must provide the name and address of the claimants and the defendant and the court that issued the claim. And then it also must provide details of the hearing. The contents of the letter 
differs slightly if it's sent to the housing department. So that's the second party to receive notice. That uh, also has to provide the full address of the property. I mean, in practice, I'd suggest that you prepare a letter that complies with all of the requirements and then send that same letter to the three relevant parties. Finally, Rule 55.4, when you go along to your first hearing, you need to provide evidence that that letter was sent. Uh, Commonly, this is done through a certificate of service. And you also need to provide copies of the notice for the judge. The second point of case preparation before the first hearing, uh, when you go along to your first hearing, and this depends really on what you, if you're looking to be securing a possession order at that hearing, it's important that you bring up to date financial information to the judge uh, of mortgage arrears and interest on the arrears. Now, the normal rule under part 55 in part uh, sub rule 83 is that evidence must be provided in writing. And also, sub rule 8, 8 sub rule 4 is that witness statements providing that evidence have to be served no less than two days before the hit two days before the hearing this pr- ability to provide upstate financial inf- information is recognized as being an exception to that general rule so it is permissible for a legal representative at the hearing to provide information evidence orally I've set out as well on this slide, just a reminder of when you're looking to prove your entitlement to possession, these are the documents to make sure that have been provided and uh, appended to the witness statements that you will have prepared in advance. Uh, An official copy of the charges register now, and an official copy of the mortgage deed. A point to be alive to here is that there can be changes in party names. It may be that the mortgage company has changed its name. It may be uh, a a number of things can happen. If the name on the deed and the charges register isn't the same as the name of the claimant, make sure that you have the documentary evidential trail to explain why it is your charge that you're relying upon when you're coming to the hearing. I've put as well the home rights search certificate that make sure it's valid. Now, Section 11 of the Land Charges Act 1972 says that the home rights search certificate needs to have been issued within 15 working days of prior to the date that the particulars of claim was signed. This, These three requirements, of course, concern registered land. If you're dealing with unregistered land, what you're looking for is the original mortgage deed, and then also the appropriate K-17 or K-18 land charges search, the certificates from the land charges search. So they were the three key aspects of case preparation before the first hearing. Now, what can happen at the first hearing? As I've put out on the slide, the borrower gets lots of flexibility. So no, under mortgage possession proceedings, or under possession proceedings, actually, no acknowledgement of service is required. There is a sanction set out under sub rule 7.3. It's rarely invoked, but it says that whilst the defendant, if the defendant doesn't comply with the 15.4 requirement, Uh, for filing a defence within 14 days, they can still take part in the hearing, but the court will have considerations to that when thinking about costs. Nathan's mentioned already, talking about summary judgment, that it's not available against a defendant. uh, And the... Uh, he's explained as well the threshold requirement that's applied to defences, and I I don't propose to elaborate on the defences. You'll remember that that threshold requirement, if a defendant is to raise a defence, is the court will consider whether the defence raised uh, suggests that the claim is genuinely disputed on grounds which appear to be substantial. Of course, strikeouts, I I just point put this as a a matter to keep in mind. It's not one that often rises in practice, but strikeout is available. Uh, The reason it doesn't often really arise in practice is because the court will be applying that threshold requirement uh, to any defence that is raised by a defendant, such that if it 
isn't, if it doesn't meet that threshold, the court may well likely go on to make a possession order. And that is what I set out uh, as the first possible outcome as to what happens at the first hearing. If the defence is raised, but it doesn't pass the threshold, then it's likely, provided that you've complied with all of the rules, uh, a possession order will be made. If, and this is the third possible outcome, if a defence is raised and it does pass that threshold requirement of being genuinely disputed on substantial grounds, what will happen is like is that the court will likely make further case management di- directions for the matter to be adjourned and to be considered in depth at a fuller and a longer hearing. Uh, and it will be dealing with issues such as allocation. Uh, if it is being allocated to the multi-track, then the court can make cost management orders. It doesn't tend to, given the fact that what well, it's often a litigant in person defendant who needn't prepare cost budgets, and mortgagees often have their what well, they will invariably have their contractual entitlements to recover costs on an indemnity basis under the terms of the mortgage. And that's something that the practice direction to part 44 explains courts will often not interfere with. Uh, The second possible outcome, or I suppose it's a third, given that I've addressed three before two, the third possible outcome is that the borrower simply wants more time to pay uh, the arrears that have accrued, in which case the court may proceed to make a suspended order under Section 36 of the Administration of Justice Act. And that is what we turn to consider now very quickly. Uh, I'm conscious of the time. Ultimately, Section 36 provides the court with a statutory discretion to interfere with the mortgagee's rights to possession. And that was set out under the 1970 Act The scope of that discretion was then expanded under the 1973 Act by Section 8. I've set out on the slide here the the terms, and it follows on the subsequent slide as well, the the terms of Section 36. There is a lot of detail here, and I've highlighted the particularly relevant provisions. What are the key points to remember here? Well, firstly, this is a provision that is engaged on an almost on a very, very regular basis in mortgage possession lists. So it's something to be thinking about when you're bringing when you're bringing a claim. When is it engaged? Well, firstly, you'll note that it has to be land which consists of or includes a dwelling house. So it's not engaged if you're dealing with land premises. Uh, It's not engaged if you're concerned with an excite where a case where a mortgagee is looking to exercise power of sale uh, because it provided it's an action in which the mortgagee is claiming possession of the mortgaged property. Uh, there isn't any requirement set out for the mortgage or to be in possession. So it, this is something that does apply to buy to let mortgages. Uh, fourthly, it doesn't, it's not just concerned with arrears claims it can be concerned with other breaches of a mortgage so you'll see that the at the towards the end of section one it provides to remedy a default consisting of uh is likely to be able within a reasonable period to pay any sums due under a mortgage or to remedy a default consisting of a breach of any other obligation arising under or by virtue of a mortgage uh and Fifthly, what's important to note is that the court is going to be assessing, and this is the crucial thing, whether it appears likely to the court that the mortgagor is likely to be able within a reasonable period to pay, and then it's any sums due under the mortgage, or to remedy a default consisting of a breach. The focus is on whether it's the mortgagor who will be able to do that, not a third party. Now, subsection two sets out what the court can do if those requirements have been satisfied, if the court is satisfied that the mortgage or will be able to pay any sums due under the mortgage or remedy default within a reasonable period. And the court has a very wide statutory discretion. Uh, I've underlined any sums due under the mortgage. That's because on a barefaced reading of Section 36, the consideration for the court was 
whether or not a mortgagor could clear those sums due. Now, mortgage contracts often have a contractual provision such that when there's a default, all of the sums fall due. So the question for the court would be, Can now that there has been a breach uh, and arrears are accruing, can the mortgagor now clear the entire sum that's due under the mortgage? And that was where Section 8 came in. What Section 8 says, and again, it, it's a detailed slide, but in substance, what Section 8 is saying is that the assessment for the court is not whether, and this is Section 8, of course, of a subsequent uh, set of a piece of legislation three years later, it was recognised that there needed to be a provision to avoid that assessment bit having to be undertaken because nearly in it, almost inevitably it was the case that of course the mortgage or couldn't clear the entire sums due so section 8 subsection 1 of the 73 act says that the assessment is in fact whether or not the mortgage or can clear the arrears so it's not the entire sum that falls due but simply those arrears subsection 2 of section 8 goes on to say that the assessment for the court is whether or not it appears likely that the mortgage or would be able to clear those arrears within a reasonable time and then go on to be able to keep up with their mortgage as well. Uh, and that leads to what the mortgage or has to be able to show. And that's set out at the bottom of this slide. What the mortgage or needs to be able to show is that they can maintain the current monthly instalments uh, and then also what's been termed the Norgan minimum. That's a reference to the case uh, which I've set out at the top of the slide, the Norgan case, where the court explained that the starting point when we're considering this reasonable period of time uh, is the remaining term of the mortgage. So it, it leads to the Norgan calculation, uh, as it's called by practitioners, where you, you look at the arrears that have fallen due, you divide that by the total number of months remaining on the mortgage, uh, and that gives you your Norgan minimum, which is then to be added to your monthly instalments. And it's for the mortgagor to provide evidence that they will be able to clear those sums. I should highlight that it, it's the starting point, the remaining term of the mortgage. It's not the end point. Uh, and in the case of Norgan, Lord Justice Evans identified other factors that can, or the factors to be considered when a party is suggesting that the reasonable period should be less than that of the remaining term of the mortgage. In practice, it's often seen to be the starting point and the end point, but that's in no way binding. Uh, finally, uh, I've put a couple of things not to be forgotten. Uh, Section 36 is engaged by breaches other than arrears breaches, as I've explained already. Uh, section 8, and this is clear from the wording which I've highlighted, isn't engaged when you're dealing with repayable on demand mortgages. And both provisions, section 36 and 36, 38, uh, section 36 and section 8, will also apply to an all monies charge. Uh, that, I'm afraid, is all we have time for. Uh, so I will stop sharing the slides. Uh, I've put a couple of top tips on here, uh, which are relatively self-explanatory uh, with regards to making sure one issues in the county court and also the approach to be taken on costs. Well done. That's a really helpful run through. Um, interesting. <laughs> My ears pricked up when Ian was running through some of the technical requirements for N123 <clears throat> protocol checklists. It took me back to one of my early days when these forms first came out. I think I was acting for NatWest Bank or a lender client, and they robustly told me, well, we the protocol doesn't apply to our mortgage, so we're not giving you an N123. And because I duly trooped into court, it was somewhere obscure like Wilsdon. Um, and the district judge sort of bashed me for not having an N123, even if it only ticked the box to say it doesn't apply. I remember his parting words as I left the court was, Mr. Clayton, have you ever done a mortgage possession case before? So you learn your lessons from things like that, really. Um, but no, it's really, really helpful. And I think that presentation just kind of flags up how technically difficult the procedure for managing mortgage litigation really is. Um, it's not for the faint hearted, unfortunately.
Um, I'm going to stop there and just thank, firstly, Nathan and Ian for their brilliant contributions. They are hugely effective um, mortgage lawyers. Um, I don't often say this, but if I had a, a mortgage problem, they'd be my go-to lawyers for help and advice, frankly. Um, but also to thank everyone who's joined us. Um, it's great to have so many people wanting to, to join in these webinars and to, to learn about all the various mortgage bits and pieces that we do. But as I always say, if you need any further help or advice, um, do please contact us in Chambers. We're down-to-earth approachable people. Our, our clerks are super helpful. And I'm sure we can sort you out on anything. Finally, do keep your ears and eyes open for our mortgage seminars next year. As I said at the beginning, I do hope we'll be coming back out in person uh, in Chambers or at a town and city near you even. Um, but for now, I'm going to call it a close. And thanks very much indeed for joining us and see you soon.